Yo, what is going down, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning Wise Cracks Movie Podcast. Toys in every store. That's right, folks. The holidays are here, and this year they're saying they are here to stay. So we're here with the first of many Christmas episodes to come. <laughs> Talk and die. Hard. How many Christmas episodes are to come, Raymond? Well, like I said, the holidays are here to stay. Okay. So uh, an indefinite amount, I mean, but there's no shortage of them. And, uh, you know, this is probably a hot take. I don't know if you guys have ever uh, have ever thought this or had, had it occurred to you. But Die Hard's kind of like a Christmas movie. <laughs> this, the, the debate <laughs> How is over. dare you? The debate is over. It's not even a thing. Obviously, this is a Christmas movie, so we don't even need to talk about whether it is or whether it's not. We're just going to presume that it is, and we're just going to kind of talk about the film. But of course, as you could have told by the intro, I'm Austin Hayden. I'm joined by the Show Me the Meaning crew. We've got Raymond. Hey, everybody. And joining us is the lovely and wonderful and fantastic and, and intelligent and insightful. And we've had a lot of requests for her to come back. Amanda. I feel like you're flattering. Um, thank you. Hello. Happy to be here. And we will be talking about Die Hard. And the only question about whether or not this is a Christmas movie or not is, is this the greatest Christmas movie? So, I mean, I guess that's something that we could talk about. Um, and then, of course... It certainly has the greatest line in Christmas which is, movie history. I shot a kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, I think last Christmas, didn't we do Bad Santa? We did do Bad Santa. Wait, I think Christmas. I you were, did Bad you Santa. You were there with us. You... Yeah. This is like a Christmas tradition. Wow. This is a... This is a Christmas miracle. Which is just so funny because I'm the, the three mo- of I'm us. just the I know. I, I do it. <laughs> which, well, which you're I not just a Jew. Me, I mean, I'm, I, am, I contain multitudes, <laughs> but I am a Jew watching a Christmas film. Do you celebrate Christmaca? Um, no, but the OC does have a very, very special place in my heart. Yeah, that's from the OC. So, you know, like it was a bit, the, Co- huh? the Cohen family, you know, autobiographical. Yeah, very, in a lot of ways, very much so. So, but anyway, we're going to be talking about Die Hard 1988, directed by Joe McTiernan. Do I have to say who it stars? Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, Alexander Goodenov, Bonnie Bedelia, etc., etc. Um, Let's go around. I mean, I mean, how do we even do a film that is so iconic like this, right? Let's go around. We'll talk about first impressions. What was it like the first time you saw it? What was it like revisiting it? How many times have you seen it? Where does this film, like, does it hold a place in your heart? If so, how big of a place does it hold in your heart? And is this the greatest Christmas movie ever made? Let's start with Amanda. Okay. This is going to take me down a few pegs, <laughs> but I'm going to be brutally honest. Oh, no. I had never seen it from start to finish consecutively i had seen a lot of scenes i knew the gist i know it i know it through osmosis it was just somehow a gap and i watched it twice for this podcast because i wanted to be really prepared (laughs) but it was it it was it it was like experiencing it for the first time because it kind of was yeah except it was interesting like how much just being in like just being a member of the American culture, like I already knew about it. Um, but anyway, the point being, it's, I mean, yeah, like it's, it's, it's a, it's a ball. It's fun. It's fun. It's, I, it's interesting. I'm excited to talk about it. I think there's a lot going on in terms of like masculinity, 1980s America, f- feminist backlash ish. Mm. Um, it's yeah and i also just think it's really interesting as an action film for like some of the little moments like the cop getting pricked by the rose thorn mm. or like the 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 um the terrorist like stopping to like eat some candy like it or like the toe thing there's just like a lot of little moments like idiosyncratic moments that give it this grounded feeling despite the absurdity that I feel like you don't really necessarily see an action film that much anymore. And are they terrorists or are they just petty thieves, right? Uh, common, common thieves. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. I shouldn't, 
by calling them terrorists, I am I am part of the problem. You're right. They're literally they're they're just enterprising criminals. There you go. That's right. They are enter. Well, John John McTiernan has some thoughts on that. We could get Ooh, into it. amazing. Okay. okay, Raymond. What about you, brother? Um, I can't remember the first time I saw this movie because kind of like Amanda was saying, it just feels like it's 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 part of you know blockbuster filmmaking's DNA yeah. at this point. Um, but I do remember as a kid, there was a diehard VHS tape sitting on top of the TV for what seemed like my entire childhood. <laughs> and I don't think I ever once saw my dad watching it or anything. It was just the one movie he owned on VHS. Um, and I remember then kind of picking it up and, and uh, giving it the once over and seeing, you know, that uh, the the cover of, or the I think the VHS cover was basically the poster with the tower on fire, Bruce Willis's mm-hmm. face and stuff like that. And it just it just looks so cool. Yeah. <laughs> You're just sitting there kind of like, oh, what the hell is this? And then uh, years go by. And uh, I don't know if you remember the Die Hard arcade game Fuck um, no. that uh, was. Yeah, in the uh, in the '90s, there was a Die Hard arcade game that was just like a beat 'em up, where you would uh, go up the stories of uh, Nakatomi Plaza. Um, so it, there were all these like weird things I remember about it, and this idea that I was forming of it in my head based on that video game was like, oh, it's a guy and he's got a, a friend that's a lady, and they they just basically beat the shit out of everyone in a big skyscraper, <laughs> and that's that. Um, you know, not until years later would we get the Raid Redemption. But uh, yeah, when I eventually did see it, whenever that was, I I had then, on top of all that, received so so much messaging about how it is the like ultimate action film it's it's got humor and it made bruce willis into a big star and there had been multiple sequels uh to diminishing returns yeah. and it, it it just loomed so large for so long that uh, i think by the time i finally saw it despite knowing as much as i did about it it still was was exciting it still felt fresh and uh, it's always a pleasure to rewatch. I probably watch it every every other year or so, cool. and um, uh, I also I think the first couple sequels are really good as well. Um, I just recently rewatched the second one because my roommate's obsessed with it, and uh, I think that one's a hell of a time. I, I think this movie's a blast. Uh, there's a reason that it became the the sort of gold standard in action filmmaking, and the one that everyone was ripping off for so long. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited to talk about it. Sick. Uh- yeah, so for me, I mean, I watched this as a kid growing up a lot, and then actually I hadn't seen it in like fucking 20 years since I was a teenager. So th- it was great to revisit, and especially now with my more critical lens, my um, years of like looking into, let's say, examining the structural unconscious of uh, political economic and social economic um, and cultural motifs and structures and things like that. So it was really interesting to me. Um, I was really taken aback, like Amanda mentioned, particularly about 1980s America. Immediately, I was like, wait, so it's Nakatomi Tower, so it's Japanese, and in the 80s, everyone thought that Japan was going to, like, fucking mm-hmm. take over America. Mm-hmm. So this is like the invasion of a, 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 a type of empire, a corporate empire that's coming in. And so I think that's really important to understand that this building, what it signifies in terms of its own. And, you know, that one guy, is it Harry? The guy that's the deal maker that's like, look, we're all just, you know, fucking yeah. criminals here. I use I'm Hans, a, baby. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, booby, you know, like that guy. Um, <laughs> they're like corporate raiders, but these people are like kind of like criminal, like non-legal uh you know, the, the non, the, not the black market, but sort of like the alternative market version. Um, but I thought that was really important. And then of course the technology, I thought tech, I was really interested in technology and I wish that I could have seen it in the theaters in the 1980s and been like, Oh my God, these criminals are different. Like Hans Gruber isn't like big and bulky and hunky. I mean, he's got his henchmen, Mm. but he's smart. 
and he's strategic and he uses a hacker, a computer hacker. Like in the 1980s, would that not have been fucking terrifying? Would you not have been there like, oh my God, these criminals are so fucking smart. Not only do they have rocket launchers and crazy explosives, but they're also smart and techy and geeky and it's like a new brand of criminal and they're international. It's like this international syndicate, right? They they don't have like a domestic cause. There's no way to get them. <laughs> um, in philosophical terms, for all you geeks out there, if you know who Gilles Deleuze is, who also wrote some books on cinema, he and his co-writer talk about the rhizome as opposed to like the arborescent model. The arborescent model is like the tree, right? Where it's got like root system and then a trunk and then branches and leaves. The rhizome is just like, it's got no center. It's totally decentralized. And these criminals to me sort of made me think of that. There's just like, they could come from anywhere because they're anybody and nobody and all they want are fucking bonds, right? Like these government <laughs> bonds, right? Worth... 640 million that's like billions of dollars today that they were stealing so it's an insane amount of money um and so that was really interesting and then also the fact that this corporation has that's a really interesting economic so there's a lot of like really cool economic things um also like the fact that it's bruce willis who was like from moonlighting who's the action hero i love that and he's funny mm -hmm. and he's a fucking cowboy and i think this is also a story Kind of like the Ballad of Cable Hogue, which is one of my favorite westerns of all time. Love me some Sam Peckinpah. This idea of like a man at a place, a man on the cusp of time, right? The old world versus the new world. And when he first gets introduced to this new world, it's this touch screen. And they're, the guy at the front desk of Nakatomi Tower is like, yeah, if you go into the bathroom, it'll zip up your flywood. So it's again, it's about like this man from the old world who's like a gunslinger, no technology, no fluffs and frills. And he comes to California, which is like this weird place where he's being introduced to like the invasion of Japan, this Eastern corporate empire of technology. And I think there's some really interesting themes. And on top of that, it's so much fucking fun. It moves. I turned to my partner and I said, they just don't make movies like this. I know we say that all the time, but they just don't. And I, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know how. I don't know what the magic recipe is. But yeah, so I'm really excited to kind of tear this apart and, and talk about it with you all. Um, but before we do, of course, we want to give a recap. But before I give the recap, I just want to give a shout to our Twitter. Make sure you follow us. SMTM underscore POD. We release like articles and things like that where we get a lot of our inspiration from or we like refer to video essays and stuff like that of other people who are talking about the films that we address on the podcast. So make sure you follow us, SMTM underscore POD. Also, we are live. So if you're listening to us right now live on the YouTube chat, make sure you comment down below and we'll try to get to whatever comments we can throughout the discussion. If you're not listening live but you want to listen live, make sure you pay attention to your notifications so you can come in and chime in live. And then, of course, Make sure you check out other podcasts, Culture Binge, Squanch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I'm going to go into um, a little bit of a recap here to refresh people's memories about this film. So New York cop John McClane arrives to L.A. to visit his estranged wife and his children for the holiday season. Upon his arrival to LAX, he's greeted by a limo driver who was sent by his wife's ritzy Japanese employer, the Nakatomi Corporation. When he's dropped off at Nakatomi Tower, the limo driver, Argyle, offers to hang tight and wait for McLean and the fam. Once inside, McLean meets his wife and her colleagues while they're having a big old Christmas shindig. And shortly after, of course, while McLean is changing his clothes in another part of the building, all shit breaks loose, and a criminal enterprise led by the nicely dressed Hans Gruber busts the party and takes the employees hostage. And really what they're doing is they're seeking to get 640 mil in bonds from the company vault. So they kill the executive Takagi after he fails to give them access, and then what they do is they sick their hacker Theo on the task to get into the vault on their own. Now, meanwhile, McLean starts taking out the henchmen one by one. He radios for police help, which leads to Patrolman Powell coming to investigate. Now, throughout the rest of the hijinks, McLean and Powell form a bond, with McLean being the eyes and ears inside and Powell being support and then relaying info to backup once they eventually do arrive. Eventually, the FBI shows up. They take over, and they want to take matters into their own formulaic hands, but all goes awry, and the baddies one-up the supposedly smart feds. So it's up to modern-day cowboy McLean to outsmart and outgun the slick criminal crew. By the end, a battered and bloodied McLean corners Gruber and takes him out with a hidden pistol trick. As Gruber falls backwards out the window, he grabs McLean's wife, 
Holly and drags her, I'm sorry, Molly, and drags her with him, but McLean grabs her before Gruber can make any final moves. No, it's Holly. It, it is, is Holly. Yeah. It is Holly. Well, then I wrote Holly yeah. once and I wrote Holly Molly Gennaro. another time, so it is Holly. Yeah, <laughs> Holly Gennaro. Um, and <laughs> as Gruber's falling out the window, he grabs Molly, Holly, God damn it, I wrote Molly. <laughs> I wrote Molly. It's Holly, god damn it. He grabs Holly, and he pulls her out with him, but before Gruber can make any final moves, McLean unhooks Holly's fancy Rolex that she was just given by the company that Gruber was holding on to, leaving Gruber to plunge to his death. Also, I want to talk about this because I think that maybe there's something symbolically significant about the fact that mm. the Rolex was unhooked. Okay, anyway. Um, in the end, John and Holly make up. Argyle drives them back to their fam. Powell gets his vindication, etc., etc. Everything is just nicely wrapped up in a shiny red Christmas movie bow. The end. Ho, ho, ho. All right, but before we continue, we got to give a shout out to our sponsor for this week's episode, Storyblocks. Look, y'all know the deal. Storyblocks is the complete stock solution, providing an unlimited library of over a million plus royalty free high-quality video, audio, and images through cost-effective subscription plans. I use Storyblocks, Wisecrack on the main channel. We use Storyblocks for all of our rad videos. And the really cool thing is that you get subscriptions, but they accommodate for every budget, and they've got this really cool initiative where they're really trying to proactively think about diversity and inclusivity in their content. So they're always changing the face of stock footage to help creators tell their own unique and authentic stories. So make sure that you go check out Restock, which is basically their commitment to increase representation in stock media by hiring creators from marginalized communities to make sure that they create content that is more reflective of their diverse world that we live in. So yeah, check all those goodies out at storyblocks.com slash wisecrack. That's storyblocks.com slash wisecrack where you can learn all about what Storyblocks has to offer. Or, of course, you can click the link down below. All right, back to the show. All right, so I'm a little curious to hear what McTiernan has to say about the baddies, Raymond. So sure. what's what what is what does the director have to say about who these people are and, and what what is the kind of character dynamic going on here? Well, I was kind of interested in um in just keeping this maybe not necessarily in my back pocket, but I I thought maybe you had some notions about uh uh some political undertones. I think it bears mentioning that this movie positions like the American cowboy. Yeah against germans and somewhat against the japanese in a way that he's like fighting against the germans on japanese territory um but i i i think a lot of that is just sort of coincidental because uh john mctiernan talks in uh in the director's commentary on this about how if you've read the book that this is based on the germans are just they're just terrorists they're like Okay. I I haven't I, I haven't read it, but I I I'm pretty sure they're holding folks hostage. He was talking about it in in the context of this commentary. I was trying to sort of glean some details, um, but he said one of the major changes they wanted to make for the movie is that the terrorism angle is a little bit of a rope a dope that they present as terrorists to cover up the fact that they're stealing these bearer bonds. And he even acknowledges in the commentary, he's like, yeah, it's a terrible plan. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense that you would do that because terrorism is like a way worse thing to do than stealing bear bonds or whatever. Um, but he said the reason that they did that is that they wanted to make the villains kind of more palatable to the audience. Mm. And he he kept saying he wanted to give mm. that all the characters are always humming Ode to Joy while they're pulling off this heist. Yeah. And he said he he literally wanted to give a sense of joy to the movie, and he just didn't think that was possible if they were just, you know, just straightforward, <laughs> run-of-the-mill bad guys. Um, so instead, they they kind of devised this uh, this ruse so that you could not necessarily root for the bad guys, but that you would be able to stick with them from scene to scene without feeling, you know, icky for enjoying their exploits. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what you guys think, just like 
from a uh, one of the reasons I made note of it as I was uh, prepping yeah. for this episode is this notion of like the death of the author. Do do you think it's it's valid to read this film in uh, a political context or whatever when uh, John McTiernan himself has said like oh we went to great pains to try and make this as like as apolitical as possible. I feel like in it's that thing right like everything's political and like yeah, in yeah, trying absolutely. so hard to make it apolitical it almost made it like more <laughs> yeah. political it back because yeah. like um if like it they because they weren't they were using terrorism but they didn't have an ideology so in some ways like like all they they were just greedy like that was it so which is the perfect criminal for neoliberalism right right so it's almost it's almost like they unwittingly created the perfect villain for 1988 for the reagan era you're absolutely right (laughs) so yeah so in a weird way it is still like very (laughs) political and also like they're in (laughs) some ways just like a vi I mean, because, like, throughout the film, especially in the beginning, just, like, capitalism is treated as, like, like, eat, like we're not supposed to like these people who are having this big Christmas bash after celebrating a huge sale. Yeah. And their contract and, and he and Bruce Willis is so out of place because he's not like them. He's he's like uh, he's an everyman. Yeah. And. <laughs> And everyone is just, and I mean, even with like the, 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 I forgot his name, but the business guy who's like, I use a fountain pen, you use a gun. So in a weird (laughs) way, it just aligned them with the sort of like gross materialistic, like capitalism of the Reagan era. Yeah. Which is why I think shot that I was talking about, or one of the final shots with that Rolex being unclipped, it's. It's like a critique of opulence, a critique of wealth, a critique of too much because they focus on it, right? Like that business guy. What's his fucking name? We need to get his name. I keep thinking Harry, I, the booby guy. Um, but he even says, like, <laughs> yeah, when, yeah, when yeah. he's like, good, show, show, show him the watch, Holly. He's like, show him the mm-hmm. watch. And he's like, it's a Rolex. Like, that's a big fucking deal. And it, obviously, they're expensive. Hart Buckner's character yeah, what's in his this name? is, what's his name? Um, I'm scrolling through real quick. I can't, uh, okay, Harry Ellis. Harry. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's really important that, that one Gruber's holding on to it, that Holly's wearing it. And then when it gets unclipped, it's the cowboy, it's the blue collar, you know, it's the everyman, uh, from New York, the dirty streets of New York, you know, not, not the ritzy, uh, Upper East Side or whatever the fuck it is. I'm not from New York, so I don't know what the areas are. You know, it's it's the ritzy, gritty kind of guy. You know, um, what, what fucking Hell's Kitchen, Soho. I mean, where where are the ritzy spots? In no, New York? no, I don't no, know. no. Brooklyn, Queens, <laughs> Queen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that's really interesting because I sort of read it because like a lot of the film is about, or like the origin story of the film is about how kind of like his wife's ambition arguably tore apart the family mm. and the watch was like a sim was symbolic of her success and like even though i feel like it was like it's like a weird not not to go right from capitalism to gender though obviously the two are intertwined <laughs> but like i feel like it's like a weird negotiation of like women's increased power in like 1980s, like Mm. business world America. And it's like, cause at the end, by the end, yeah, he is like, I should have been more supportive. You can go by your last name, but she's like, no, I want to go by your last name now because you're my protector. So it sort of is like a renegotiation Mm. of like the same kinds of like gendered nuclear family norms. And that was kind of how I read the watch, but I also see your interpretation and maybe, maybe it's both, maybe it's neither. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Cause we could say that there's like, um, like a lean in feminism here, this woman who's a girl boss, right. And she, Mm -hmm. she gets this job and this is the new world. And John McClane is a bit of a, he's a cowboy. He's a bit of an old world head. And, you know, maybe he could have and should have been more supportive 
of her aspirations to transcend, to do something more. Because there's that bit where they fight, and and he's like, she says, like, I know what you wanted from a marriage, which I'm kind of taking that. I took that as, like, you held me back. You wanted me to be, like, the stay-at-home, not the ambitious mm-hmm. one. That's how I took it, whereas she's like, I have yeah. ambitions, I have dreams, I have goals. So there's one sense where we can critique that and be like, yeah, but the way that her goals were played out in the context of the 1980s was this kind of, like, greedy pursuit of opulence and wealth with this, you know, um, this new technology company, or we could say on a more positive spin of that, that no, he should have been supportive because he's a bit kind of resistant and conservative, maybe holding her back. He should have been more supportive of her going and trying to kind of like make something of herself and, and, um, ex- you know, like not have a leash on her, so to speak, or something like that. So it's kind of an interesting, you can, you can kind of look at it both ways. And I think, I think that he kind of maybe is in the wrong. And then maybe that's what he means at the end when he's like, Hey, I should have been more supportive. And then she takes the name. So is that kind of like a vindication of the old world or is that kind of like, <laughs> yeah, a, that's a, how I saw it. Oh, it, oh, it made me, cr- yeah. I cringe. I <laughs> cringed. <laughs> to be honest just a side note there was who was it i think was it an influencer they just got married and he took her last name have you seen this that's caused like so much shit in in the social media world i can't remember oh my god that's such like viral bait of them yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. that's the ultimate intersection of like <laughs> that's like that is lean in feminism <laughs> but, but my like, partner and I, super viral <laughs> yeah my partner and i were kind of like laughing because everyone like there's all these people that are just so upset that like a guy would take a woman's last name like it is kind of funny that that these things um are still with us right that though especially with like the name and the marriage thing but that, that there's a history to it and there's like a power dynamic there but yeah sorry i'm kind of getting off track now Raymond, yeah yeah you no 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 i i think it's uh, it's all on board although none of us have any clue what's going on in influencer culture or whatever um but i i do think there is a very uh like even when um if i maybe i'm misremembering this because i think they do the last name gag in die hard 4 with his daughter his daughter is going by genero um and when and i can't remember if it's his reaction in this one or that one or if they're essentially the same but when he sees that it's kind of like well i knew i i, I knew to look for this but it's still kind of a surprise or at the very least he sort of like scoffs and is dismissive towards it um but there is this sense of you know amanda you said like you you full body cringed at that i'm curious if if my mother the kept notion her of her <laughs> no. <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> no, no no um i was gonna say at the end the notion of her taking his last name it's one of those things of of like does that read to you as an explicit rebuke of feminism or does it more feel like in the context of this movie, it's, it's sort of a Chekhov's gun firing in a way of like, all right, they set this up, they pay it off. They've gone through something traumatizing and maybe she feels safer with the notion of him being a, uh, if not a, a, a financial provider than like, in in the traditional rugged cowboy sense like oh all of a sudden you know it's uh, i'm i'm proud i'm i'm proud to stand by my man Perfect. a little Can bit I, more let me just, because hold, let he me just, just fucking aced a group too. of terrorists this is after he destroyed her livelihood though cuz that company is no more <laughs> so <laughs> oh, yeah, i mean that is that. there's that yeah no definitely to be totally clear like i don't think there's anything wrong with taking your partner's last name regardless of your gender and like you know i have a horrible last name shirker like so i i i understand the appeal (laughs) for sending your last name um but i think it was like functioning as a symbolism he was really irked by it it meant that she was no longer acting as his wife and then once he becomes the savior reinstates himself as this like protector figure the fact that that is what that's the impetus for her to take his name back meant that she had taken her name because he was like no longer her you know what i mean it 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 added to the symbolism in a way that i actually think it would have been really cool and progressive and kind of rad if he had introduced her 
with her last name and she had been like yeah that's my last name now mm. and they were just like okay cool we don't need the same last name and she said yippee yeah exactly yeah that would have been <laughs> so so yeah i don't think it's a rebuke of feminism by any means but i think it did it was yeah i think the Chekhov's gun is a good way of putting it there's there's another i'm, I'm curious what you guys well, think say, there, there's another oh. way to look at this uh, uh, in more of like a synthesis like a kind of like dialectical synthesis so if you have at the beginning her doing her thing frustrated with him for being a bit of an old old world head him frustrated with her feeling like she kind of was like abandoning her marital responsibilities so she could kind of go off and do her own thing but then what you get maybe with her kind of being like okay i, I take the last name again that's a reconciliation i'm i'm willing to work now on the marriage and no longer be estranged and then him kind of also being like i should be be more supportive and from now on maybe he has like a level of self-revelation and he becomes a little bit more conscious and now it's much more kind of like okay and now I will support you in those things and so it's kind of like a both and like that's a really charitable reading but that's also one way yeah. to, kind of, to kind of look at this as well you know I think it's too charitable <laughs> because it's also like it's based <laughs> in like a very like the entire idea of taking your husband's last name is based in such like a old world heteronormative patriarchal. Like it just, that's the root of it. So it, well, it, I get what you're saying, but yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It's still, it just rubbed me the wrong way. But. Sure. Speaking of, um, of patriarchy, I'm, uh, I, beyond the cowboy stuff, I was getting a lot of, uh, religious, uh, undertones mm -hmm. with this watch where, uh, I'm, I'm curious y'all's thoughts on, there, there are several times when they they describe John McClane as, you know, the man upstairs. Uh, there's a scene where he's walking across broken glass and ends up with, like, stigmata in his feet. There are times when he's framed, like, angelically with fucking helicopter lights just blasting out the from behind him. Like, all of this stuff is also just cool. Um, but when you add to that the fact that this is a movie about like a Christmas miracle and, and like the rebirth of hope or whatever, there is there is a little bit of me where I'm like, oh, I don't I, I don't know. Or it, it, do you think they're they're cognizant of uh, this sort of messianic imagery that they're playing with? Or is it just uh, some happy accident? I have no idea, but I don't know if I like just hallucinated it but at one point he fell backwards almost like in a crucifixion pose and yeah. then he was like falling over like a weird couple of boards and i was like did i just imagine that because i feel like it had been accepted <laughs> into my brain at that point that he was like this like jesus figure almost yeah so i think i think it's definitely there i don't know how intentional but it feels not accidental I mean, I think I think because we love to worship things that are bigger than us or people that are like superior than the everyday, you know, those types of things like the shining lights and the bigger than life and the kind of the references like there are a couple of references to God and to the man upstairs and things like that. And um, I think that those things kind of seep in, especially in an American culture where just religion is so part of the kind of public conscious psyche anyway, you know. So there's that. And then and then also, I think there's really something like that final bit when he comes down and uh, he sees Gruber and she and he's got uh, he's got Holly kind of like tied up. It's like he um, he does kind of you, you kind of you get the backlit. He does kind of remind me of like Jim Caviezel in The Passion where he's just fucking bloodied and, you know, like bruised. And you're like, OK, mm -hmm. is this a Jesus figure, you know, or or we could just uh, say in just religious terms, monotheistic, you know, he could be any sort of messianic figure, Messiah Ben David or something like that, you know, yeah. so. Well, it's one of those things, too, that has so permeated the culture that like any any, you know, for lack of a better word, any like deliverance yeah. narrative, you can very easily graft sort of uh, uh, hallmarks of uh, of religious mythology onto. But mm -hmm. I, uh, speaking of old fashioned stuff, Mark Maurer in the chat is curious if they don't make movies like this anymore. Is it simply because they don't write books <laughs> like this anymore? Um, I think maybe a little bit, a little bit reductive, but that did make me. I laugh, do want to say this. Like, remember last week we were talking about influences, and it was like the chain of influence. It's like, does it go back to like you know fucking Neanderthals, like in in sure. the cave and shit like that? Like, we also have to remember. Yeah, you had the towering inferno. Yeah, and, and we also have and, to and stuff like to that. Remember before, that yeah. with the religious imagery that we're given in, for example, monotheistic texts, they're also drawing from 
other archetypes throughout history that preceded them. The hero, right? The hero, the savior, the someone that's going to come and deliver you, the redeemer. So those are the reason, like we oftentimes refer back, especially in the United States, we refer back to the the Christian myth because it's just what is it like 30% of the population so many people who founded the country it's It's just it's just so there right but we also have to remember that those religious traditions and that religious imagery and symbolism is also like just relying on a much more foundational human narratival structure about somebody coming in and saving our people from you know um, a a situation beyond our control or something like that so you know it's kind of it's a very human no, no, I mean, I, I hear you on that stuff. I think, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those, we can talk about like, what's that, uh, what's the dumb book, um, Save the Cat, where they talk about like, <laughs> the, the, there are only like 10 or 12 stories ever and virtually any, any story can be, re- at its, at its core can be reduced to the fundamental elements of one of those sort of story archetypes or story tropes. Um, Die Hard being the, I think as it would be described in um, Save the Cat, it's like a man with a problem. Okay. You know, it, I, I think um, to reduce it even further, I, I had heard uh, a screenwriter years ago say something to the effect of like, oh, well, there are many stories, but there's really only one plot. And that one plot that every single movie is about is something's wrong. That's the whole plot. Um, but, uh, yeah, with, um, uh, with this one, I, I think there is, there's a little bit more to it, um, at least in my estimation than a man with a problem or, uh, an updated take on Western mythology or even Christian, uh, mythology. But I, I kind of like reading this as a, um, just a story of like essentially one man going to the ends of the earth in order to like just keep his family together yeah. and that this this movie could very easily just be like oh, i don't know kramer versus kramer but it's like rather than uh the family courts being the obstacles in this way it's like a fucking burning building and a bunch of terrorists yeah I, are there any movies where they intentionally try to do a different story there's nothing wrong and like kind of just nothing happens where there's where there's nothing yeah. wrong um and nothing happens. I mean, I don't know. Like there, sure, there's tons of experimental stuff, like the mumblecore um, films. But as far as do that, but even then, it's like they're they're like uh, not necessarily. Yeah, it's like real subtle. Th- that's still about yeah, yeah, and those are still very much grounded in like very base or human or emotional wants and desires. Like that, I I think if you watch a lot of those, and this is not me saying like, oh, you know, great, um, but. It's one of those things that's like, okay, if take the first one that comes to my mind is like Baghead um, that the Duplass brothers did, which I think is a really fun movie. And it's about a group of friends who uh, decide that they 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 go to a, a horror film festival. They see a horror movie and they go, well, we could do that. And then they go out into the woods and they're trying to come up with a story for their horror movie. And then in the course of trying to come up with it. Uh, two of them devise a scheme to scare the other ones and just tape their reactions and just go from there. And it's like, do they have a problem? No, but they do want something. Yeah. And I would say like 99.9% of movies starts with just a character wanting something. And then the movie is just about what they're willing to do in order to get that thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's you you bring up Mumblecore. I think one of the progenitors of Mumblecore... Um, uh, would be Richard Linklater. You yeah. see his DNA in in a lot of those uh, sort of prosumer digital experiments. Uh, and you know, when I think of like everybody wants some, or um, you know, Dazed and Confused, uh, the, the uh, those two companion pieces in his filmography, I don't necessarily know that I would say there's anything wrong in there. But like when you wake up in the morning, Austin is there stuff that's like wrong in your I'm life? hungry uh, and yeah i mean that's the yeah. thing is like it just comes down to like objective exactly. tactics it just um, wants it's, the, it's a the want notion. in relation to a lack right yeah. and sometimes the lack determines the want and i mean maybe it depends on what you believe philosophically psychoanalytically but yeah like i wake up <laughs> and I, 
I love how our Die Hard episode, the most like clear obstacle <laughs> tactic movie ever made, has devolved into one of our Patreon discussions about like what even is a story? It is, it is, exactly. <laughs> what do you think about this film as a cowboy movie? I mean, as a as a retelling of a western, is it a sort of post western or? I was going to say to to kind of get back on track. Um, uh, Aman Ahmad in our uh, chat just mentioned, you know how the Fast and the Furious, it, the Fast and the Furious is basically the same film as Point Break. What is the corollary to Die Hard? Mm-hmm. There has to be one. Uh, Aman, uh, that's a good question. And apologies if I uh, if I uh, mispronounce your name, but there there are so many movies after Die Hard was a huge hit that were explicitly pitched as like. It's Die Hard, but on a boat. It's Die Hard, but on a bus. Like I just described Speed, speed 2, Cruise two. Control, and Speed 1, <laughs> um, regular control. And, uh, I mean, th- this this one definitely uh, uh, has such a, a big cultural footprint, but I do think before, Austin, to come back to what you were saying, we discussed Escape from New York on mm. this podcast. You can see a little bit of that, um, if not exactly... Escape from New York's influence on something like Die Hard, but the kind of movies that John Carpenter was obsessing over, you can imagine John McTiernan doing the same. Um, that you know, this is this is kind of cut from the same cloth as uh, Austin. You you reference the notion of uh, John McClane being sort of a a man out of time, uh, a man out of his own era at this mm-hmm. point, or who has outlived his usefulness and is able to, um, you know. Be as good, uh, uh, be as good once as he ever was, mm. even if he's not as good. That's fucking John Wayne's late career. That's the Searchers. Um, you know, there's there are definitely uh, or Rio Bravo is another great example. Although uh, I don't think the story structure of uh, something like this really correlates as much with a Rio Bravo as it might with uh, the Searchers or Escape from New York. But uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, got any thoughts, Amanda? To just throw you into the fire. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I mean, look, he's for sure like the lone cowboy figure. Mm. He's like very explicitly like coded as blue collar right down to like the muscle tank <laughs> um, in a world that's like very clearly like materialistic and modern and scary and not what he's used to. And he has to rely like every every institution is is a complete disaster to the point where the cops don't even hear gunshots and don't don't even like see that as cause for alarm right and so um yeah so it's like i think it's a classic western in terms of like breakdowns of institutions and the lone individual with like a good Mm. head on his shoulders has to save everybody yeah, and he's the man of violence that comes from the mean streets, right? Like he's talking about how he's got this backlog of criminals, six months, da 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 da. His captain back there is always trying to tame him. He's the he's the wild, right? You know, and then he mm-hmm. comes here to this domestic California. And he mentions that multiple times, like Jesus Christ, California, basically, right? But it's this world of corporate suits, technology, things are in place. The the one guy, the bad guy, you know, says like there are things you can't do as a cop, right? So again, there's the rules, but he is the man outside of that. Mm-hmm. And he, he uses violence to create a civilization, to create a world, <laughs> right? The question is though, is can he stay? And this is um, I, I I love the book. It's called Six Guns in Society. Um, it's basically about yeah. Westerns. It's a great book, uh, kind of like a sociological analysis of the Western uh, as an American myth. And one of the things that – I can't remember the author's first name. Is it Wright? Um, is it Ronald Wright? It's it's W-R-I-G-H-T. I can't remember. The I think first. it's Ronald. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he talks about how like the man of violence in the classical Western – kind of formula comes in but can't stay which is why at the end of searchers john wayne can't come into the house which is why it's shane he rides off on the horse which is why in logan you know which is basically just a retread of all of these kind of western ideas logan has to die right he the man of violence uses the violence to create the world and create a semblance of peace but is not allowed in that world so the question is i think is, i mentioned one of my yeah. favorites last week uh, monty walsh as well mm-hmm. high noon says peter crooker in the chat you know a lot of great examples yeah. So the question is, what, is, what was the question, Austin? Well, so then if Bruce Willis, if he's attacking this new technological, economic, corporate entity, 
and it gets destroyed, um, after Happily Ever After, what happens, right? Like, They're by Coastal. <laughs> That's right. Do they, do well, they I mean, have an agreement you... and they kind of like, you know, half the time in New York? <laughs> this, this movie is a little bit of a sitcom, or rather this movie series is a little bit of a sitcom because after each one, despite whatever resolution they've reached, by the, the beginning of the next one, it's like, yeah, we're on the outs again. <laughs> they just have to like keep resetting his relationship dynamic. And I mean, on one hand, that's lazy screenwriting, but on the other hand, it's like, well, yeah, it kind of tracks with the person that we perceive him to be with uh, within this narrative. That, like, uh, as you said, Austin, that whether he he can't be tamed, or maybe there's a far less romantic way of describing it. I know, watching this movie, it's it's one of those things. that's kind of like. It's such a bummer to watch the fourth and fifth ones, especially because you watch this. It's similar to watching the fourth Indiana Jones, where you go from like, oh, I want to be Indiana Jones or I want to be John McClane or whatever. And then you go to like, oh, I, I don't think Indiana Jones even wants to be Indiana Jones anymore. <laughs> and Bruce Willis definitely doesn't want to be John McClane anymore. <laughs> um, but there, there is... Uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there's a, a weird, like, w what I think is so, so great in this one, and one of the reasons I think it sort of catapulted him into action stardom, despite the fact that his bona fides up until this point were, like, you know, TV acting, and he's, like, a, a more traditional, yeah, romantic leading man, is that, like, he just seems, he seems approachable, he's, like... I love the beat at the beginning where he sits up front with Argyle because it's just like, no, I don't, I don't feel good sitting in the back because that makes mm. me feel like I'm in charge of you or whatever. Like they do this great stuff to kind of communicate how, how down to earth he is. And I think that pays dividends when you start watching the movie and, and he starts getting into really big trouble. It's like, it makes him fallible in a way that like by the fourth movie, doesn't really seem to be the case. And I feel like that's also just indicative of like what ha how maybe like how action movies have changed as not like a huge action movie buff, but um like I feel like I you don't see a ton of action films where by the end the character is as like bloodied and like on yeah. the verge yeah. of like death as this character seems to be and like he takes his hits and then they have consequences. Like I love, that's why I keep coming back to like the foot thing. Like the fact that mm. he's barefoot the entire time because he was doing that foot thing to get grounded after being on a plane yeah. cause he was scared. Like mm. it definitely. And then I also, that's why like the mask, like just the masculinity element of the film is really interesting because like at one point even like yells at the police officers, he's like these fucking macho guys who are like, mm. you know, uh, uh, about to like storm the building which is like not because he's I feel like his brand of masculinity is less like brute force and more like smarts and like mm. intuition and, and 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 like um it's just more like subtle or nuanced maybe and um yeah, sorry, I went off on a rant, but yeah, no, this is this no, is no, great no. because you know they they don't have like Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger like these like these gods in male form just walking around. You know, they've got a guy who's vulnerable, who's got a big fucking scar on his shoulder from like a botched surgery from when he was a kid. Where you're like, oh shit, this is a this is a real person, right? Like, and he's not super ripped, and you know, he's got like nice chest hair coming out and stuff like that and you're like this is like a, a dad you know he's got a little bit like he's obviously in okay shape but he's got a little bit of a dad bod you know he's not like fucking a chiseled out of stone and then you've got the fbi who come in with their rigid tactics they've got the machines and then you get the one guy that's like it's just like being back in fucking nom or Robert Downey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a fucking yeah, he's psycho. Just, he's just like, he's like the old world kind of cliche predator type of masculinity that you might see, you know, like in the films Predators where it's just like bulging fucking muscles and they're like, we're going to fucking, you know, and, and it's, it's, you get a vulnerable hero with Bruce Willis and there is something kind of lovely. And I love what you said, Amanda. I think it's, it's necessary that he's not just using brute strength too, not only because he has compassion and family concerns 
Um, and it allows him to come to that self-revelation at the end. But also he has to outsmart this new stock of criminal. Like mm -hmm. you can't just match them gun for gun because that's th – these, these guys are smart and they use technology. So you have to have a, a little bit of like – you have to meet them where they are. Kind of have to play it, the Rather game than just being bit. like yeah. the top-down formula, which is what the feds were trying to do. Um, and I do just want to say, uh, someone in the chat called me out. That one account, 931, said the relationship isn't reset in the second one. Uh, Holly's on an airplane. The airport is being taken over by terrorists. Then their relationship is reset to a, uh, a bad one by the third film. Uh, well observed, that one account, 931. I apologize. I just, like I said, I just rewatched the second one. And that totally slipped my mind. But there is a, a B plot that the plane is running out of gas and they can't <laughs> land it. So they keep having to do loops. And Holly's up there just like trying to help everyone keep calm and stuff. Um, very, very fun movie. But uh, uh, all apologies. I will atone. Please don't put coal in my stocking. <laughs> yeah. Amanda, do you have any other? Because uh, Raymond and I had a chance to babble for a minute while your computer died. Do you have anything? Yeah. Can we can we give you the spotlight for a couple minutes? Do you have anything special that you took in notes or more things that you want to bring up that we can kind of chew on? Um. So, okay. To go back to the thing we weren't going to talk about, why do people debate whether this obvious Christmas film <laughs> is a Christmas film? <laughs> and from my perspective, I think it's because, like, Christmas isn't necessarily coded as, like, very masculine. And if you think about Christmas films, they're very much centered, like, in the domestic. And they're about, like, forgiveness and charity and mercy and fan and and this one is not that and I think it's like there's maybe an incompatibility with like even the like like I know I'm maybe contradicting myself a little bit because I said he's not brute force masculinity but he's still like there it's there's like a ruthless out like he he fucking kills every single terrorist yeah. like like there's no there's no you know taking prisoners so I feel like that it's like a cognitive dissonance and that's been like the source of the debate is that we're not used to seeing like it's hard for us to reconcile Christmas with this sort of like brutal masculinity that's just a thought yeah until of course jingle all the way and then you get Schwarzenegger himself Schwarzenegger and the and the silver screen's most masculine icon Sinbad fighting over <laughs> a uh, an action. Figure. Well, it's interesting. So um, if we if we take the Christmas thing in America under like a consumerist materialist um, approach, it's about like buying and giving gifts. And this film is all about like wealth and greed and like the exchange of things or acquiring things, right? And you kind of then get a family story that really drives everything is Bruce Willis is just He's going out to see his family, and in the end, he gets the best Christmas gift of all, which is he gets reconciled with his family. So absolutely at the surface level, it doesn't seem like it, but there's also a real sort of like holiday season kind of heart that's about family and, and showing up for your kids and, you know, reconciling for your mistakes and, you know, those times of reflection that kind of like cause mm -hmm. you to, to stop in your busy everyday lives. Mm-hmm. But Amanda, to your point, it's also not just John McClane that like in the context of this film is is being valorized for adopting, you know, cinema friendly expressions of masculinity, we'll call them. But even like the character Al Powell, whose entire character arc is got demoted because he shot a kid. <laughs> By the end of the movie, the way that he like gets his <laughs> groove back is by learning how to shoot, shoot a human. Again. Yeah, <laughs> and instead of like following through on the trauma that he surely has like not only inflicted on others but has internalized himself, and the way that that has maybe changed him as a person and possibly made him more self-reflective, it's like fuck that. The way you get your mojo <laughs> back is you pull that motherfucking trigger out. I mean, fucking Holly Jolly, am I like, right? 
Is this why you, it is? It is Holly Gennaro. Do you think Dolly. it's this tension? I mean, we're totally speculating here, unless you've read reviews that say this explicitly. But do you think that maybe this is why the film was kind of released to mixed critics and let some people actually criticized Willis's performance and it's because he wasn't like the standard action hero and maybe they had a hard time accepting that he was this more vulnerable guy because of his comedic past and like uh, is it a Christmas movie is it not a Christmas it's an action film but it's a weird action there's a lot of violence like there were a lot of critiques about this when it first came out yeah I think it's like I think it defies categorization Mm. to some degree that maybe Mm. confuses people in our like branding obsessed Hollywood mindscape where we're like, this is we're walking in knowing exactly what to expect and anything that deviates is unacceptable. Well, I I also think it, it maybe bears mentioning that um, at the time, I think a lot of critics saw this as sort of like the ultimate expression of Hollywood excess. Mm -hmm. Um, even if, you know, maybe over the past hour we've been making the argument that uh, it might be critiquing that excess or it may just be a product of that excess that seems quaint in retrospect because our blockbusters have gotten so much more excessive now. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I can see how folks maybe watch this and... I also think that not all critics, but some film critics who maybe were tastemakers of the time had a notion that like, well, this this very type of movie in much the same way that people look down their nose at all horror because they judge it by the worst type Mm -hmm. of horror. uh, Maybe they they just characterize this as the worst type of action and they 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 don't have any kind of like way of differentiating that just because it is within this sort of ghettoized genre that they're they're going to write it off or or dismiss it lightly Mm -hmm. but um who knows uh there is there is one uh question in here uh aman ahmad uh jumped in and asked uh if the casting of bruce willis in die hard perhaps opened the door to michael keaton Mm. in batman i know uh based on tim burton and michael keaton's history working together when they made Beetlejuice together, going into Batman, Tim Burton lobbied him for uh, for him pretty hard. I think that Warner Brothers kind of uh, wasn't so sure about it, but I, I I think that maybe there's something there. But more more so, I think that Tim Burton making a hit movie with Michael Keaton probably opened the door for uh, Michael Keaton and Batman. Um, but uh, also, I think Michael Keaton is such a great choice for Batman because he's just fucking off and <laughs> i think a lot of a lot of other adaptations of batman miss the point that he's a fucking psychopath <laughs> and i think Michael Keaton is really great at, at getting that aspect of the character yeah um what do we but, think final thoughts here before we jump into the mailbag amanda anything you want to say about your first experience um watching die hard and are there any amazing uh, Hanukkah films that we need to be paying attention to here that, uh, that, that fly under the radar with like the deluge of Christmas media that we often refer to? Oh my God. I don't think I, I can't, I don't think I can think of a single Hanukkah film, much less a single good one. Other than like Home for Purim is fun, but that's about a, a, a spring <laughs> holiday. Um, yeah, it's but you know, I mean, Hanukkah isn't Didn't that big of a holiday. It just became a big holiday because Jewish kids wanted to not be sad about missing Christmas. Like it's not that actually important, like in the in the context of Judaism. So uh no, there are not. Final thoughts on my first start to finish experience uninterrupted. Um yeah, just like a fun, interesting portrait of a moment in <laughs> American history that I think in a yeah. lot of ways is like reflective about that moment and in other ways, like not that self-aware. Um, and I think like an interesting action film that like you guys said, like set the precedent for future action films that would almost invariably not be as interesting as it was. Mm. Um, So I think it's, I think it's like as weirdly enough as mainstream it is, I think it's like something of an oddball. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, Raymond, what about you, brother? Yeah. Um, I mean, just off of what Amanda was saying just now, it, it is it, it is kind of odd to look back at this movie at this mm. point. It, it reminds me of um, I mentioned Indiana Jones earlier, and uh, Spielberg and George Lucas talked about how when they when they made Indiana Jones one of their sort of north stars in the writing and development process was this notion that they were going to make a movie with all the boring bits cut out and they were like can we write a movie that's only the good bits and uh indiana jones rules but if you if you watch it now it feels like it feels like an art film in a mm. way <laughs> like it's similar mm. to this where these these may be like i said before they they may be the the utmost expressions of, of cinematic excess for their time. But it, it, it is, uh, like you said at the beginning of the show, Austin, it's, it, it's, uh, kind of a bummer that they, they don't, uh, make them like they used to, at least not as often. I think John wick is a great exception to the rule there. Those movies rule. Uh, I mentioned the raid redemption earlier, fucking phenomenal action series. Um, and, uh, one other thing I, I would mention that, uh, for uh, some great context about like positioning this movie within the context of its time, uh, both politically and culturally, um, Amanda and I were talking a little bit before we went live. Uh, there's a, a really good commentary on, I think it's like the 40th anniversary DVD, but I'm sure the commentary has been reused on the Blu-rays and stuff as well. Uh that shuffles between a track that was recorded by John McTiernan and a track that was recorded by uh, Jackson DeGovia, who was the film's production designer. And he specifically talks a lot about the design that went into Nakatomi Plaza and how he was drawing from, from stuff of that era in trying to create like the backstory of not only these characters, but the corporation and what influenced that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely a movie that feels like it, it, it feels timeless in its mm. narrative structure, but it's also a, a very cool little kind of time capsule of, of uh, like you said, Reagan era excess and um, uh, and and how that has not only uh, changed upon reflection, but also affected movies going forward. I love that. This is like my favorite way of of analyzing a film is looking at it as a cultural artifact, mm -hmm. right? And when you're in the midst of it, kind of like when you're swimming in the midst of life in the present, we're often not aware of kind of the broader picture, the context, the sociopolitical, the kind of like gender relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only in hindsight or stepping outside of the context or listening or kind of looking through the eyes of the other that you can get sort of a, a richer perspective. And um, sometimes time is kind of like the perfect othering process. And, uh, and I love doing that. So just for people who are out there like wondering, like, how do you get started? Like, I actually remember listening to people talk about films in this way when I was younger. And I was like, how do they even, I, I just, like, I was like, I just don't think in those ways. And I want to, and I actually had to work. I had to struggle. Like I would listen to fucking Slavoj Žižek do like psychoanalytic critiques of film. And I'd be like, I just don't get it. Like, how do you get into that kind of thing. And I think one of the really helpful ways is just starting by exactly like Amanda and Raymond were just saying is think of the film as a time capsule or a cultural artifact or a snapshot of a moment. And then start looking at that moment and start thinking, oh, what influences, kind of unconscious influences maybe formed the background. So as much as McTiernan tried to depoliticize, in what ways did he unwittingly politicize in another way, right? Yeah. Those kinds of things are really interesting and helpful. And um, yeah, and like I said, if you got more questions on this, please feel free to email us, movies at wisecrack.co. That's movies at wisecrack.co. Um, we can also, you can call us at 1213-534-8807. That's 1213-534-8807. Three four eight eight zero seven, and you can leave us a voicemail. And maybe this would be great for a Patreon episode in the future for us kind of talking about like media criticism, film criticism. How do we approach a film? You know, what are some good resources? What is it and how is it exactly. done? Exactly. Um, but yeah, but real quick, I did want to just say that we got a couple of emails and we got a voicemail. We don't know who it was from and it kind of was cutting in and out about Whiplash. Um, we'll try to kind of like address some of those things maybe in the future. They were about like the relationship between sports and passion and desire. I think a lot of people were kind of like oh that's a really cool way of looking at whiplash as a as a film about like music 
excellence or obsession um, towards greatness, but how that kind of like maps on to other pursuits, one namely being sports, which is something we talked about in the episode. But um, so just so you know, keep the stuff coming in. We're not going to address it just because we're kind of running up against the time here. But uh, we did get all that stuff, so make sure you keep flooding us with your comments. You can, again, email us, movies at wisecrack.co, or call us 1-213-534-8807. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, SMTM underscore POD. All right, let's get out of here. Where can people find you on the internet? Amanda. Uh, I tweet like once every six months at Amanda Shirker <laughs> and, and, and watch our Wisecrack videos. Wise crack. I, I write and edit all of them or I write all of them. I write a lot of them. I edit all of them. Amazing. And Raymond, what about you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd. I'm at Crematoria. And if you uh, still have the Christmas spirit after listening to this podcast, I would recommend another wonderful podcast episode. Uh, our friends over at When Cinephiles Attack did an episode on the Muppet Christmas Carol last week. That is one right. of the funniest podcast episodes I've heard all year long. Uh, Happy holidays, everyone. Austin, what about you? Uh, hit me up on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden, Insta, AUS underscore H-A-Y. I've got a philosophy podcast called Owls at Dawn. After a long hiatus, we are back. Two new episodes will be dropping before the end of the year and back to regularly scheduled programming. Send us out of here, Raymond. Let's go. Uh, goodbye from Nakatomi Plaza, booby.